Hello and welcome back to Cooking with Terre. Today is a special episode. I'm going to be talking about a sous vide circulator and its use. This is a device that has a heating element in it. It has a little propeller to move water and it has a very, very carefully calibrated thermostat that holds the water at a very precise temperature. It's used with food that has been sealed in one of these little pouches. Now you can use a regular um, freezer bag, a Ziploc freezer bag, for example. You don't have to have the special pouch and the special machine. Uh, I, I use it a lot, so it was worth it getting the, uh, the little pouches. Also, this is the best way to freeze food. If you put a food in this, it will not get freezer burned. You're taking the oxygen out so it doesn't deteriorate nearly as fast as it would if you just wrapped it up and threw it in the freezer. So you seal food up in a bag like this, put it in a tank of water, put the circulator on, set the temperature in that you want, and eventually that food will arrive at exactly the temperature that you've dialed in. And different temperatures have different effects on different foods. And a small difference, a degree or so, can make a big difference in texture or it can make a big difference in, uh, for example, on a steak. You want a very precise temperature so that you can get the degree of doneness that you're looking for. The nice thing about the sous vide as well is that once it gets the food to that temperature, it can hold it at that temperature for a fairly long time without much changing. So for example, a steak. Normally, if you miss the timing on a steak by a few minutes, you've ruined it. With sous vide, you can bring it up to your desired temperature. You could hold it at that for an hour or two and it wouldn't matter. So this is a very useful tool. I, I, we use it a lot. Uh, if you only used it for thawing foods, you can thaw food with it by simply putting the circulator in a container of water that is now below 40 degrees, put the food in that same water and keep it below 40 degrees. Even at a temperature below 40 degrees, it will melt uh, the, or it will thaw food very quickly, again, <clears throat> without getting any water on the food at all because it's all sealed in a bag. You might wonder where the name sous vide came from. Uh, this actually goes back into the late 70s. There was a chef in France who wanted to cook foie gras, this is uh, fatty goose liver, he wanted to cook it without losing any, not losing any of the fat. So what he wanted to do was to seal it up in plastic and then bring it to just the right temperature with losing nothing because foie gras is very expensive. And he said, why am I cooking this in a way that drives off a lot of the fat? It's the fat that's so delicious in foie gras. So he went to an inventor who's also a, a foodie and they came up with uh, adapting a piece of scientific equipment. In laboratories, for a long time, there have been these water baths that circulated hot water for a variety of laboratory experiment reasons. They adapted one of those and sous vide was born. The word sous in French, S-O-U-S, means under, vide is vacuum, so all it means is cooking food that has been vacuum sealed. And you can cook sous vide using a lot of different things. In this case, we're cooking in a water bath using the circulator that maintains the temperature. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to first thaw a uh, pork belly that I've frozen. When I buy a pork belly, I buy a big slab. And let me just also clarify something about pork belly. A lot of people hear that term, don't know what I'm talking about, fantasize something, I don't know what. Pork belly is what bacon is made from. So if you take uncured bacon, you have pork belly. If you have it in a slab, you have slab bacon. So this is the, as it comes from the pig, the, the chunk of meat that would be ordinarily be turned into bacon. Uh, so we take that, I, I take that slab, I cut it into portion sizes, much more manageable for us. I vacuum seal each of them using this device. So I put it in one of these bags. This device sucks the air out of the bag and then uses heat to seal the bag. And then I put each portion in the freezer so that anytime I want pork belly, I just reach in the freezer. To bring it back, I put it in the circulator at a temperature below 40 degrees. It is thawed. Then I increase the temperature to 140 degrees. And an hour later, it has been cooked all the way through. And so we're going to cook pork belly today. So when we come back, I'll have the uh, circulator going with the pork belly in it. Okay, we're back. This has had almost an hour and I've moved the circulator into the, this uh, tank. Now, you don't have to have all of this fancy gear. I use the circulator a lot. When you want to have a party, like uh, you want to do barbecued spare ribs, 
It's nice to have a rack to put all of the ribs in. It's nice to have extra space in there for all of this. This is overkill for just doing this one little piece of pork belly. But now the pork belly is completely thawed and it's ready to be cooked. So I'll show you the way we use this most often. A little clamp on here that just holds it on pretty much any vessel that you want to use. So any pan with some depth like this is suitable for sous vide. And now I'm going to put the circulator on this. And I'm going to set the temperature for 145. There's a little dial here that you can crank in pretty much any temperature you want within reason. All right, so here we are at 145. I hit start and now it'll take care of it from there. So this goes in about an hour from now. This will be completely cooked and this fat cap on the top will be softened because the next step is I'm going to pierce this to allow a lot of the fat to escape and get this nice and crispy uh, when we put it into the air fryer to finish cooking. I know this is fairly elaborate, but you know, in truth, it's not very much. You put it in uh, cold water, you put it in hot water, and then you transfer it to the air fryer. All right, we'll come back in an hour and see that that is fully cooked. Okay, so we're back after an hour and the pork belly has cooked. So now it's done to 145 degrees, which is adequate for the meat to be done, completely cooked, and this fat cap on top to be nice and soft. So I'm just going to take it out of the bag and dry it off. And then to prepare it for the next step, I'm going to just pierce that fat cap with a fork. It's nice and soft now, so I can just pierce away without actually getting into the meat itself, but create lots of little holes in the top of the fat cap so that as it cooks, it will release an awful lot of the fat. And what it's going to leave behind is this lovely crispy skin that will be delicious. Okay, so after piercing, both before and after piercing actually, I'm giving it a nice pat with paper towels. And it's going on the tray, the rack, uh, in the air fryer. And I'm going to put it at 400 degrees. And I'm going to give it about 20 minutes. I'm going to come and check it. And then perhaps 30, perhaps longer. Each piece of meat that I've done has performed a little bit differently. So I don't like to make any advanced decisions about how long it's going to take. But I'll just pop this in the air fryer at uh, 375 and we'll see how it looks after about 20 minutes. Well, welcome back. In the meantime, uh, the pork belly has been in the toaster oven, or in, excuse me, in the air fryer and I'm going to take it out. It's had just about 20 minutes. And what you can see is that it's gotten nice and crispy. A lot of the fat has rendered out. The meat is now completely cooked. From here, we can go any direction we want. We could take this and do an Asian stir fry. We could take it and do a Korean, uh, something like japchae. Or in this case, I'm going to take it in an Italian direction and I'm going to be baking a uh, pasta alla carbonara. Now, typically in a carbonara, you would have guanciale. If you couldn't get that, you would get pancetta. We're in a place where we can't get either one. So I'm going to use pork belly, which believe me is a perfectly good substitute. I don't think any Italian would be offended by this. So I'll see you in the next episode where I'll prepare a pasta alla carbonara.